again, American Roots Music students. I'm so tickled to be with you again today. And we're going to talk about Chapter 4, which deals all in uh, Anglo-American secular folk music. So uh, not religious music, all secular music. That comes up in Chapter 5. And to begin with, I want to talk about ballads. For hundreds of years, ballad traditions have influenced uh, all of our music, for that matter, but especially the Anglo-American folk music. However, there are also differences of opinion as far as how we classify and how we assess and rate the, these works. Some people feel like the older ballads have more value than the newer ones. Some do not. And, of course, we're going to talk about the many different types of ballads in this chapter. Some scholars have chosen to limit their studies to certain periods or certain subject matter uh, within the ballad traditions. And then there are other in individuals who have kind of taken more of a broad viewpoint. So we're going to begin by asking, what is a ballad? And this is something I want you to always remember. By definition, a ballad is a story song. Ballads tell stories. Characteristics of the ballad. Oftentimes, ballads are told from a very impersonal tone. Uh, essentially, you're hearing someone very objectively talk about a story that's that's uh, quite dramatic in many cases. And they tend to really kind of glide past um, the uh, less dramatic portions and focus on the highly dramatic portions. Um, sometimes ballads may be compared to newspaper articles for the same reason. They're letting the listener form the opinions and just delivering the facts or the data, one might say. Also, the ballads are typically told in order. You don't necessarily jump backwards or, or skip around in a ballad. There, there may be a lot of leaping and lingering, as we're talking about, but it doesn't necessarily go out of order. So again, with leaping and lingering, leaping and lingering means that we're kind of jumping past or gliding past the less dramatic portions and focusing on the very, very dramatic parts, the parts with a lot of action or a lot of uh, intense drama. Oftentimes, there's an unsettled early situation and it's resolution. Um, but maybe not a lot of details as to how you got from the unsettled situation to the resolution. They tend to gloss over those uh, uh, details, the fine details of the situation, and focus on the consequences and the actions. Also, ballads are subject to change from region to region and from time to time and generation to generation. So as one can imagine, especially since most of these were passed along orally, a lot of changes do take place. Why don't all songs uh, gain the classification of being a ballad? Since most songs do seem to tell a story, why don't we call them all ballads? Lyric songs, which is what you're likely to hear on the radio today, do tell a story, but they usually only hint at the story. They don't put in lots of detail. So they, don't, they may not use the names or very many specifics at all, but they do tell a story, or at least allude to a story. If you had a, a song that, that sang about heartbreak and so forth, and they tell about the olden days, that doesn't really get very specific, but it is a message that most people can relate to, and it's something you're likely to hear on the radio. These humorous, sad, or satirical songs often deal with the same subjects you find in ballads. Again, love, work, death, and tragedy. Uh, blues and country, uh, rock and roll, are, are very, very likely to fall into this category, what we call lyric songs. The other thing that uh, might uh, be used to differentiate between the lyric song and the ballad uh, might be more than just the message. It might be, as um, some would uh, consider, the intent of the tune. Uh, Mr. Laws draws distinction, and I'm talking about Malcolm Laws, who, who wrote some incredibly important works in uh, regard to categorizing and uh, uh, collecting ballads, as you will find out in your text. Uh, he essentially assigned um, symbols, letter symbols, to describe the different uh, subject matter of ballads. But nonetheless, Mr. Law drew a distinction between the, excuse me, Mr. Laws drew a distinction between the ballad form and other songs, not necessarily so much in the subject matter, but in the 
intent of the subject matter, the purpose of the subject matter. So essentially, the purpose of the ballad, um, as he was saying, was to tell the story. But the purpose of a song or a lyric song is to really just um, instill in someone a certain state of mind or a certain certain feeling or sentiment. And I think we could probably all agree that most of the time that's what we do find when we listen to a, a tune on popular radio today. More than a really, really detailed story, we're, we're uh, kind of painting the picture of a feeling or a mood that we're likely to encounter. Um, child ballads are what are known as child ballads. This has nothing to do with being for children, but there was a man named Francis James Child who was a Harvard professor and a very, very successful, very diligent, uh, very famous collector of ballads. And he wrote um, a series of, of books that's considered to be uh, really, I guess many would say the definitive uh, collection of ballads called the English and Scottish Popular Ballads. And uh, essentially, this particular uh, series was so influential and still is so influential that the works that are collected in this grouping are known today as child ballads. Professor Child uh, was interested in some very specific uh, categories of balladry. Um, he specifically liked to collect ballads that were um, created before 1475. Um, he didn't um, really appreciate the ballads that uh, were created uh, after the printing press showed up in, in Europe, he felt like that those were uh, becoming of lesser quality. So he was interested in pre-printing press ballads. Broadside ballads um, are a whole other category unto themselves, although sometimes there's a little bit of overlap. Typically, people think of the broadside ballads um, as being a little newer. Again, after the printing press, they were often printed on one side of a very large piece of paper, hence the term broadsides. And essentially, um, many people uh, felt like that these ballads were printed so much, so rapidly, and so commonly that uh, they were becoming so commercial that many people feel like these ballads were of lesser quality. Um, there are certainly people who would dispute that claim, but that is a, a common mindset that was out there. The characteristics of broadside ballads. These ballads tended to be a little bit less objective than the earlier ballads, so they might have been a little bit more uh, prone to, to offer uh, a commentary or at least kind of imply a, a feeling or a sentiment that the author had about the events. Uh, not quite as, as uh, objective, as I say. Broadsides tended to be topical. In other words, they may have focused on current events. Uh, in today's time, uh, someone could write a, a topical ballad about uh, COVID-19. That's something that's on many people's minds. It's been a very, very tragic circumstance, and maybe there's already been some ballads written about this pandemic. If not, I'm sure there probably will be. Also, uh, formulas become a little bit more uh, standardized and stereotypical. Specifically, they used uh, and tend to use at least something called the come ye all salutation, which could go something like this. Come gather around and a story I will tell, or come all ye good people and listen to my tale. Um, I'm sure you've all heard a tune that starts like that. It says, everybody gather around and listen to my story. Um, that's essentially a, um, a characteristic that's very common in ballads of this era. In addition, broadside ballads were often more subject to be re recomposed, to be changed. And of course, we have Native American ballads, and we're talking about not necessarily the ballads that were um, written by Native Americans, but I'm talking about um, per se, but, but the ballads that were written here in our country, so they're native to the United States. Our textbook um, points out that with the strong ballad tradition and folk music of the British Isles, the emergence of indigenous American ballads was really inevitable. As soon as the Puritans settled in New England, this process did begin. And nearly, strangely enough, nearly all of the best known Native American ballads, such as John Henry, the Titanic, uh, came from the second half of the 19th century. So uh, really most of the more famous tunes, again, the Casey Jones, ballad. Uh, John Henry probably is the most famous uh, American ballad uh, 
bar none, maybe even the most famous American folk tune. And of course, we had Western ballads, ballads that kind of uh, detailed the lives and the uh, needs and the, the desires and the wants and the concerns of the cowboys, uh, things that were written out in the Western states as the cowboys rode the trails on those lonely nights. They, they uh, enjoyed singing, and uh, it was a good way to pass the time. Of course, uh, Western music has had a strong influence on American country music as well. At times, country music has been called country and Western, and certainly the Western theme is often played up uh, in American country music. Ballad traditions and professionally composed uh, tunes by Tin Pan Alley composers. Our textbook talks about the Tin Pan Alley composers. These were essentially people who worked in a um, legendary street in New York that uh, was nicknamed Tin, Tin Pan Alley. And these folks in the 1800s began writing um, incredibly uh, successful commercial tunes, and they were professional songwriters. And they could write tunes, um, and they did. They would adapt to whatever trend was popular at the time. They could write cowboy songs or uh, uh, songs about mothers and homes that were popular in the late 1800s. In the 19 uh, teens, Hawaiian uh, themed tunes became very popular, and so they started writing Hawaiian themed tunes as well. But the Tin Pan Alley uh, craftsmen uh, wrote a lot of tunes that became popular in the early days of recorded country music. Uh, of course, the ballads were often played and, and often reworked for country music in those days. Mm -hmm. 